بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله to start off we'd like to first and foremost congratulate our Imam, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa saman on the auspicious occasion in which it's the birth anniversary of our Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha, in which we have this celebration over the past two nights to look at the significance of such a person and what kind of aspects we can learn from him and put into our lives, insha'Allah. Now, for the topic for tonight, in reference to the Imam that we are celebrating, I'd like to look at one aspect of his life. And that aspect is in reference to a particular debate that he's had in the court of the Ma'moon Khalifa at the time, which was the seventh of the Abbasid Khalifas, in which he brings forth the best atheist scholars, if we can refer to them as scholars, the best Christian priest and the top Jewish rabbis, if we can refer to them as such. When he brings them together, he wants to challenge the Imam first and foremost. When he looks at seeing the knowledge and the depth of knowledge of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, or the furthermore, the actual people that look up to the Ahlul Bayt and what they exactly they look up to, as in, is the Imam all knowing, all knowledgeable? as the followers say or does he not stand a chance against the best of his time now it was a very definitive aspect in reference to the ma'moon and what he had to do now when first looking at this particular event in history we have to look at first and foremost inshallah in our day because that happened 1000 odd years ago and we look at it how can we learn from such an aspect learn from how the Imam debated how the Imam went on to teach the message of Islam how he went on with the morals to play a part in teaching us how to have dialogue and what did he say and how did he say it and that's inshallah we can apply to the 21st century nowadays because when we look at it we look at the aspect of knowledge of the Imam first and foremost and then secondly, we'd like to look at the aspect in which we want to learn from ourselves. As in many of us are in primary school, here tonight in front of me, other people may be at universities, other people would be at college, other people would be at TAFEs, in the workforce, wherever you may be, it's not just, it's not a, a country in which it only has one specific religion. However, we are gifted to be in a country in which it has an abundance of religions, an abundance of beliefs in order so that we can talk within one another, have dialogue within one another to better understand the different faiths and to strengthen the faith that we have in our Imams. Now the first, the first aspect is knowledge. When we look at knowledge and we've discussed knowledge on many aspects before, when we've discussed knowledge, we've advised ourselves that knowledge is not enough. That's gaining knowledge, yes, that's one aspect. However, there are many types of knowledge what someone may gain that may make you arrogant. As in, how many people do we know that they've learned a couple of verses of the Holy Quran or they've learned a couple of texts or read a couple of books and they become very arrogant. Every time you try to speak with them, every time you try to invite them over, every time you try to gain closeness towards them, they might look down upon you, may look down at your particular rank. Why? Because they say to themselves that I've attained a higher rank. I have achieved a level of greatness that he may see or a level of knowledge that he may see. Now in saying that, then we know the first and foremost knowledge is not enough. There's a certain aspect which we want to look at tonight is this aspect of wisdom. How to go about debating, how to go about 
portraying the vision of Ahl al-Bayt, the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt. As in Ali ibn Abi Talib gives us an aspect of this, the particular knowledge, and then inshallah we'll move on to the debate that our Imam that we're celebrating tonight had, and what we can learn from that debate. Ali ibn Abi Talib once upon a time, a person, whilst he was around with his friends, a person came and cursed Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now look at the aspect of Imam nowadays, if we want to learn from Ali ibn Abi Talib nowadays, when we look at universities, and I'm saying in a first hand perspective, in primary school, in high school, people come and they may say ill things about you. They may not necessarily say the best things towards you. They may try to encourage the anger within you, encourage the retaliation aspect. They want to see what your reaction would be. Now on that aspect, on the first level, we look at what our Imams have done. Because it's one aspect, and this is a very important thing we need to look at in all ages. Because one of us would say that yes, learning about the Imams, that's one thing. And it is, 100%. It's very, very important to learn about the Imams. The second level, the second level, is that once you've learned, how much do we apply? It's one aspect saying that Ali ibn Abi Talib did such and such, but it's another aspect following in his footsteps. When we learn in school or in our workforce or within our friends or wherever it may be, if we learn that Ali ibn Abi Talib, what he does when someone enrages him or attempts to enrage him, do we follow it or do we the opposite? Nowadays, someone may enrage us, you find that we have our friends on speed dial, we get all the boys together, or if it be females, I don't know what happens nowadays. The boys all get together, they wait for someone outside the school, or outside the universities. There's some aspects of harassment that may take place. There's many aspects in which someone can retaliate, someone can have a negative effect on the person that has started, or has initiated the oppressive nature. Ali ibn Abi Talib teaches us, you shouldn't do such a thing. And he teaches us, and he teaches his companions. When someone walks past and curses him in his circle whilst he's around his companions, a person straight away gets up, does what we would do. Straight away takes out his sword and says, you know what, I'm going to prosecute you. I'm going to judge you based on what you've said and I'll prosecute you. Takes it into his own hands. Ali ibn Abi Talib says yes. That there is an aspect of yes, an eye for an eye. We have that in Islam. However, look at what Ali ibn Abi Talib says. He says, because he's cursed him, he says, Sabun Biseb. So he can curse, he's cursed you, he can curse him. He says, Oh, Afwan and them. He says, He's sinned. He's a sinner. You're in an aspect in which Allah can elevate you or He can degrade you. When we have our hadith that say, If you use your intellect over that which you have pleasure in doing, if you use your intellect rather than your emotions, and we're saying negative emotions in this aspect. If you use your intellect that Allah has granted you, saying that, what? Ali ibn Abi Talib would do such and such, I will act in such a manner. Even though myself want another thing. Even if myself would prefer such and such, which is negative. My mind and my intellect and my knowledge about Ahl al-Bayt teaches me that they would do this particular action. So Ali ibn Abi teaches us that, yes, he's sinned. You're in a position of power. Either you have the power to prosecute or you have the power to forgive. And Ali ibn Abi Talib teaches his companion says, yes, and if you forgive, it is greater in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that aspect, if we look at it in the first level and try to apply that first level to our lives, if someone enrages you, try to look at, say to yourselves, what would the Imam do? What would Ali ibn Abi Talib do? What has Ali ibn Abi Talib done? Now moving on to the aspect of dialogue and we want to look at it, why is it such an important dialogue to, to, to talk about tonight? Why is it such an important topic to talk about, especially in this particular age? The age of communication, the age in which you may some, say something and it may be aired all across the world. Something, someone may video, nowadays we look at and it goes viral all across the world. Some people may find stuff that are funny, other things there are calamities that happen. However, we find that people can communicate, they can be across the world and they can communicate their ideas. They can communicate 
their beliefs. They can communicate that which is good and beneficial and that which is destructive to a society. Therefore, why is it that it's important to learn how to go about talking? Why is it important to learn how to go about acting in the path? Because in this particular age, we know that one action we may do may travel the whole world without a shadow of doubt. One thing, it could be videoed, it could be documented, someone could say it and it could be carried all across the world instantaneously. Therefore, watching what we do as followers of Ahlul Bayt, as people that hold themselves very close towards the message of the Prophet of Islam and the message of Ali ibn Abi Talib, we have to, on the first level, have an importance of knowing how to act, knowing what to do in particular circumstances. And especially on this level in which we have different beliefs in this country that we live in. People of different beliefs, diff different ethnic groups, people that have different ideologies. How is it that we can go about, not necessarily preaching, but how can we go about teaching by our actions and how we talk. Now that's what we want to learn from Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha tonight in reference to the debate that he has. And we want to look at three particular points. One, he had a debate with an atheist. We want to take one point from that. He had a debate with a Christian. We want to take two points from that. And the third, we want to take a point from his debate with the Jewish rabbi. And we want to end it to look at how he had dialogue with the Ma'moon, in which was the Khalifa of his time. Because as we know, Imam's Imamat was 20 years. 10 of those years were under Harun al-Rashid. Five were under the Amin and five were under the Ma'moon. How is it we can look at, in particular reference to the last five years of his life, in reference to the Ma'moon and that particular event that happened in which he brought all the greatest scholars of the time to have that debate with the Imam. Now let's look at the first level. Imam teaches us that we have to have an eloquence in how we approach things. An eloquence in how we speak and a respectable aspect of whom we speak to. It could be the worst person. It could be a person from a very degraded status. And I'm saying that in the reference to the status in Allah's eyes. Not a status in a social status or a wealth status. No, that's not, nothing that Islam looks at. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna akramakum and Allah atraakum. The best amongst you are the most God-fearing or the most pious. So when we say the degraded rank, the degraded rank in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on the first level, we have to look at the aspect of respect that the Imam had. That even his followers after him, and we've mentioned this many times before, in which we had the great scholar that writes Al-Mizan, in which when he had a di dialogue, with the French Christian priest of his time. And he writes a book called the Shia. The first thing in which he does, he mentions to the person, he says, no, that yes, I have a great rank in my community and you have a great rank in your community, without a shadow of doubt. However, I want to first and foremost elevate the level saying that we want to look at each other as human beings firstly to not have any bias or anger towards one another and what he does he takes off his turban and puts it down he says you know what now we can talk as humans he says well, i've taken off my turban there is no bias here he says we want to have a dialogue based on facts and figures we want to have a dialogue based on knowledge and not based on anger and corruption he lays down the foundation. That's when we have nowadays, when we go and say, you know what? This person from that faith, don't associate yourself. This person is from this particular faith, don't go towards him. And we have it nowadays. When you find that ISIS and first accounts, when people have caught in Iraq, they've caught these particular people. And to say, what kind of religion are you on? What kind of God do you believe in? What kind of prophethood do you believe in? Because they say, in the name of Islam, we kill Muslims. Well, Ayyad Billah, what kind of religion is that? That's iron irony. It's destructive what they've been taught. Someone may come to them and say, do you have an aspect of morale? Do you have an aspect of what? Listening to the other party. Understanding from the other party. And they try to talk to them. You know what the reply is? 
after someone begins to talk, they say, if we talk to you, because they, ha they go on days without talking towards the people that give them the food, the people that have enclosed them after they've captured them. They say, we're not allowed to talk to you. Why? Does your religion teach you not to talk to people? He says, no, we're not allowed to talk to the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Why? Why is it you're not allowed to talk to the followers of Ahlul Bayt? They say, we're not allowed to talk to the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Do you know why? Why? Ahsant. He says, because we're associated with the Husayniyah. That's very right. It's because they say that they've been taught that the people that come to these Husayniyat, the people that come towards these mosques, don't talk to them. And if you do, you have to fast three days. Habibi. You can tell them, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> Habibi. Inshallah. So the brother has, has pointed out that <laughs> he wants a bit of quiet. Thank you so much, Habibi. And inshallah, look at the aspect that we want to look at as what they've been taught. The aspect of how they're being taught. Because the aspect we can learn from that person in particular jail, what does he say? He says, we've been taught not to talk towards the Shia of Ahl al-Bayt. Why? He says, because they will mesmerize you. They are magicians that make and take away your mindset and allude to that which doesn't exist. The Prophet ﷺ, before when he brought the message, the same thing that people called them. They called him magician. They called him the liar. After the entire Arabian Peninsula called him as Sadiq al Amin, the trustworthy, the truthful. So we find that that particular aspect has been carried down through the generations. Until nowadays, we have people calling themselves ISIS, saying what? Saying that do not talk towards the followers of Ahl al Bayt. However, what we learn is not from these people. What, we have to, what they have to learn is not from people that they find finite. We find people that are infinite, are infallible. People that you cannot utter something bad in reference to them. People that have never made the mistake their entire life. You find them as role models. And one of the role models is the one that we celebrate tonight. That we aim to learn from. Look at how he has respect towards other religions. When he has, and he begins the debate by talking towards a Christian man. The Christian man looks at Al Ma'moon, the other side of the courtroom. He says, how is it that I can have a debate with this Imam? The Ma'moon says, why? He says, he believes in a book that I do not believe in. And I believe in a book that he does not believe in. Then how can I go about debating him? How can I go about having dialogue? The Imam looks at him and he says, don't worry about getting references from my book, the Qur'an. He says, I'll debate you based on your book. The first level, what did we say? Knowledge. Imam had such grand knowledge, not only of the Qur'an, he had knowledge of the Bible, of the Torah, and of the books that ascended from the heavens. So he says to the question, I will debate you based on that which is written in your books. I will debate you based on your Bible. So the person looks at him, the Christian man, he says, then how do you prove your prophet from our religion? Why is it that your prophet is greater than that of what we believe to be the son of God? Why do you think that the prophet has an elevated rank? So the prophet, look how beautiful the imam replies to this question. Knowing that having knowledge and having wisdom are two different things. Having knowledge and having wisdom can be in balance if you follow the Ahlul Bayt, if you follow in the footsteps that Allah has preached for us to follow in. Some people have knowledge, but they can become very arrogant. They can speak out of turn. They can, be, they can speak when it shouldn't be spoken. And do not keep quiet when you should keep quiet. But having wisdom means what? Means that even if you have the knowledge, you know and you are wise enough to know when to speak and how to speak. The Imam teaches us both in this instance. He knows when to speak and how to speak. He asks him, he says, We believe that our Prophet Muhammad He says is a greater rank from the Prophet Isa because he prayed more. Now look at this instance. He used praying. He didn't mention anything else of the miracles. He says that we believe that he is greater because he prayed more. 
So the person, the Christian man, he's enraged. He says, how can you say he prayed more than our Lord Jesus? So the Imam got him in the corner. He says, hold on. You say that Jesus is the Son of God and you've given him divinity. Can you tell me if you worship him as a God and you believe that he prayed more than our prophet, who he was praying to? Question. Person puts his head down. Look at the perfection of the wisdom of the Imam and how he puts it in a circle. So the Imam asks him, he says, why is it that you say that he is the son of God? Why do you say that Isa ibn Maryam and giving him the rank of divinity is the son of God? So look at the reply of the person. The person says, he says to him, we believe that he's the son of God because he resurrects the dead. And anyone that can resurrect the dead should be worshipped. So the Imams captured him once again using his wisdom. He says, hold on, in your Bible it says, and in the Torah it says, that's before them. There are many prophets that have resurrected the dead. And he mentions two prophets. He mentions al yasa He says he resurrected pe people after their death. And he mentions another by Hizqil, I believe, or Hizqiyal. Do different things that they use. So Hizqil, he says he resurrected 35,000 people after their death, after 60 years of their death. 35,000. After 60 years, he resurrected them. He says, why is it that you believe in Jesus, son of Mary, and you do not believe in them? Because if you take him to be divine, you have to also take them to be divine. On the second level, he puts his head down in shame. Doesn't have an answer. On the first level, he didn't even know that the Imam knew from his book. Amongst many other debates. Secondly, he looks at the Jewish rabbi. And he asks the Jewish rabbi, he says, Oh rabbi, he says, can you tell me, why is it that you've concluded that the prophet of God is Moses and no one else after him? He says, of course. He says, we've come to the conclusion that this particular prophet is the prophet of God because of that which he has produced in miracles. So the Imam asks him, he says, does everyone that produce miracles have to be, wor have to be worshipped and be put in a rank in which he is the prophet and be followed? He says, no. He says, then what? He says, only if he's brought forth the miracles in which Musa has brought forth. So the Imam says, he begins to mention miracles and miracles and miracles of different prophets within history. Then he asks the question, he says, hold on, you believe or have is it not to come across to you the miracles that Isa ibn Maryam has produced? Then he replies by saying, says, yes, we've heard about it, but we have not seen it for ourselves. The Imam again puts him into a corner with his wisdom. He says, hold on, have you seen the miracles of Musa with your own eyes? Hasn't the miracles of Musa been dictated to you by different sources? The same mannerisms, the miracles of Isa have been dictated towards you and prescribed towards you. Then how is it that you believe in, Isa, uh, in Musa and don't believe in Isa? That's the second level. Puts his head down. He says, the Imam's got me once again. Wisdom. And knowledge, when they go hand in hand, you become unstoppable. Wisdom and knowledge, especially when put into the path of Ahl al-Bayt, it's unstoppable. Following in their footsteps, unstoppable. As in there's, and the final level. And this is a very jurisprudential question, a question which is used in theology. When he looks at the atheist, and the atheist says to him, look at the question, and I want you all to think about it before I answer it. We'll move on to another hadith, then we'll go, go back to it, to allow you to think about this question. The atheist looks at the imam, and he says to him, I want to ask you a question about tawheed. So imam says, carry on. He says, is Allah in his creation, or is the creation in Allah? What's the question? Is Allah in the creation or is the creation in Allah? Think about that question and I'll return back to it with the reply of the Imam. Another aspect I want to look at before I return to the question and end for tonight is an aspect in which you reply to other schools of thought in Islam. Now that's how to go about in different 
interfaith dialogues and having knowledge and wisdom. How is it that we can go about in dialogue within Islamic thought, within Islamic schools? And that's knowledge upon knowledge. We can refer to books such as Peshawar Nights, books such as Muraja'at, in which all the misconceptions are being looked at. Someone reads it, their knowledge will increase, their ma'rifah will increase, the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, the responses, Everything you will be equipped with the weapons to defend yourself. If you refer to these books, one instance, Al Ma'mun comes towards Ali ibn Musa al Ridha. And look at the question he asks in front of a crowd. He says, He says, Oh, son of Rasulullah. He says, Can you tell me how is it that you believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib is deciphering between Jannah and Nar? He says, where do you find, or how do you conclude that Ali Qasimul Jannati wa Nar? Where is it that you find this? And the Imam looks at him. He doesn't reply from his own books because we, we have an abundance of treasure, of ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, of knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. However, when having different dialogues with people outside the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, you need to have knowledge of their books. Because if you bring forth, well, you know what? We say such and such. He says, well, I don't believe in what you believe in. If you have knowledge of what they believe in, the Imam replied to them using their Torah, their Injil, their philosophy in reference to the atheist. And even in this, he refers to a hadith from his family, al Ma'mun. He says, does not your father say from your father, so his grandfather, from Abdullah ibn al-Abbas, he says, a hadith. He says, what's that hadith that you refer to? He says, doesn't that person say, and whoever loves Ali ibn Abi Talib is in heaven, and that person who hates Ali ibn Abi Talib is a kafir? iman wa kufr. Does not your, your grandparents say that? The person whom, from whom you are descending say that that Ali حبه, Iman وبغضهو, كفر. he says yes he does he says إذن, فقد قسم الجنة والنار. whoever loves him will go towards paradise and whoever hates him will go towards hellfire look at the response not from what he says not he says I heard my grandfather say he says no 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 I have an abundance of treasure here Mam Ali, how many times do we hear Ali ibn Abi Talib saying that which he has? How many times? Exactly. The more you learn about Ahl al Bayt, the more you will understand that treasure. Ali ibn Talib, how many times do we know that he says to himself, here is an abundance of knowledge? He says, Ilman Jamma. People come towards him of his ashab. He says, we know a hadith in the thousands. As we know, the first and second khalifa didn't allow hadith to be portrayed and carried on. Imam Ali says, dig a hole and say it within the hole and then cover the hole because no one will listen to you. He says, here is knowledge in abundance and treasure. So going back to the point that says what? How can we reply to the atheist that says, is Allah in us or are we in Allah? Have we thought about it enough? How can we reply to someone that comes and says, well, where is Allah? Is he in us? Are we in him? We're his creations. Has he created something away from him or is it in him? Are we in? How does it work? The Imam gives an example that no one may have come across. That may think outside the realm or outside the box that we may think in. He says, tell me about the mirror. Look at that example. He says, tell me about the mirror. Are you in the mirror or is the mirror in you? How does the mirror work? He says, neither. He says, likewise, what you see on earth is a reflection of Allah's mercy, a reflection of that which he has created. When you look at the Ahlul Bayt, you find that they are reflections of his names, reflections of his mercy, reflections of his justice.
That's why we hold on to them because in them we see salvation and closeness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah on that note, tonight we can learn that to go about dialogue with other religions, with interfaith dialogue, whether it be within the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt or outside that school of thought. That first, we have to have knowledge. And second, we have to have the wisdom to say how to go about saying something and saying it at the right time. And after all of that, knowing that on the first level, you have to first and foremost act accordingly. Without saying a word, if you act in a righteous manner, act in a manner which pleases Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman you will draw people towards you without even uttering a syllable. And that's what inshallah we want to learn from tonight and try to our best abilities in the future to come to have this in mind when having interfaith dialogue or having dialogue within any particular person, whether it be within Islamic thought or or outside Islamic thoughts. And I say this, brothers and sisters, we want to pray to Allah to elevate us in knowledge. We want to pray to Allah to elevate us in rank, so much so that He may raise us with the companions of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, with a Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat, Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.